computer. Okay, cool. Yeah, I have split screen going. Um, okay, so it is recording now. Welcome, you two. I wish you were on my screen in the lecture room and I was looking at both of you, but um, you know, <laughs> such is life. I actually wish I was where I was supposed to be right now, which is on a plane to California, but that is not happening. So what here were we are. You, what were you gonna be coming out here for? It is, um, or it was going to be the um, 15 year reunion of my husband's business school class. And so we were supposed to be out there. Ah. Shauna's neck of the woods, but hopefully I'll make it out there sooner rather than later. Um, all right, so I want to start by introducing you to, welcoming you to Fit Nation, my class. This is our grand finale session where after a whole semester of looking at the history of fitness culture in the U.S., bring in incredible experts yourselves to talk about, yeah, your perspectives on where you've come from in the past, but really I'm interested in who you are now and what you think about where we're going. So I want to start by just introducing you. The students have all gone through your info online and they've actually come up with oh, cool. for today, so they know you. But for anyone who's kind of watching this later, um, uh, right above me, um, if your vision, if your view is the same as mine, Shauna Harrison, PhD in public health from Johns Hopkins University, one of, I would say, the first social media influencers um, in fitness, but one who I should say has taken uh, that role on with great responsibility, something that we'll talk about today. And like marquee instructor at every brand you've ever heard of, as well as creator of her own formats. Right below me, Pete McCall, also a guy with many letters after his name, for basically every legitimate fitness certification, a master's um, of science as well. Um, and somebody who's, I think, come up in this fitness industry in such an interesting way that wouldn't have been possible you are 20 years older. So um, a fitness educator, a trainer of trainers, someone with an enormous amount of experience, both in one-on-one -on -one contacts, but also all over the world working with some really big brands. Am I kind of doing you all justice? Uh, I, I think you got it. I mean- I'll take I, you I, with me anywhere. <laughs> exactly, thank you. So Good hype woman there. <laughs> so one of my fir my first question for the two of you is because we've talked about like how recent the formation of fitness as a profession really is. And I'm just curious to know very mm -hmm. basically when you go to a party and you meet someone and they say, what do you do? What do you say? <laughs> Sean, I'll, I'll defer to you for... <laughs> By the way, one of my least favorite questions in the world <laughs> is what do you do? Because I'm, I'm always like... I don't know who's asking me. Like, you know, oh, you're at I, a party sometimes with, I'll say I'm a fitness and yoga instructor. With like other smart Sometimes I just say like, I'm a fitness and yoga instructor and I just leave it at that. Mm -hmm. uh, depending on if I feel like the person is going to understand what I actually do. Um, and kind of depends on, you know, if I'm in a, in a situation where people are a little bit more on the academic side, I'll be like, oh, I have a PhD in public health. And also, um, mm -hmm. so I mean, really, when I when I try to sum it up as best as possible, I basically just say that like I I'm about movement in many different ways, right? So it's I'm on the academic side, I'm on the practical side, I'm on the writing side, I'm on the social media side, and all of it has to do with movement. So I don't know. I, that's a long way of saying I don't know. What I do. <laughs> How about you, Pete? Well, I, one of the things I, I'll say is I'm like an education consultant, and because you, you if you ever tell people you're a personal trainer. And I'm sure, Sean, you've experienced this. If you tell people you're a yoga instructor, you get what, we, what I call the, the exercise confessional of where yep. you get somebody, you're at a party, somebody has you know, a plate of hors d'oeuvres, they have a glass of wine in their hand. They're like, well, this isn't normal. And then they start telling you everything they've done in yeah. exercise. And I'm like, no, I don't care. I don't freaking yeah. care. Am I wrong? Am I right about that, Sean? Do you have that experience where you get that whole- All the time. They, they start, you know, so I, I've learned, I try not to, I say I'm an education consultant, and if they ask further, I'll say, oh, I work in the fitness industry and kind of leave it at that, you know, just in a yeah. setting. Yeah, that's so interesting. I think that that ex exactly that feeling that you're like judging them or that you have these perfect personal habits that exactly. comes from this interesting place of like people <laughs> hold up fitness professionals in some way. It's like, oh, you must like only eat organic food and work out three hours a day and think I'm less than if I don't. Right. Well, that's, exa yeah. that's exactly it. Yeah. <laughs> 
And then on, on, on the other hand, though, it sounds like Shauna, what you were saying before that, you know, sometimes you'll mention, oh, I have a PhD. Sometimes you'll say I'm a fitness and yoga instructor. Do any of you or either of you ever have had the response of like, you say, oh, I'm an instructor, or I'm a trainer and people kind of assume, oh, you must not be that smart or that's all you do. do you, have you ever gotten that kind of? Um, uh, from my own father. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, he actually wrote that on Facebook without thinking that I would see it uh years and years ago and you know he was like my daughter you know he was explaining to someone what he's been up to and like mm -hmm. what i had been up to i guess and he was like yeah my daughter graduated from hopkins with her phd in public health and now all she does is teach yoga so mm -hmm. yes there's definitely like especially if people know that i have an academic background then the judgment really comes in if they if they just look at me and they're like oh you're a fitness and yoga instructor I think I personally take the judgment, even though they probably aren't actually judging me. I'm just like, but, yeah, but I'm more than that, <laughs> you know? Um, but yes, I mean, if, if people know that I have an academic background, that is one of the first things that they say. How yeah, and I, I got that a lot. I mean, I, I have to, I'm, I, I came into the industry different than, than other people. I worked in politics first. So I actually worked on Capitol Hill for a little while and I was working at a major non nonprofit organization when I decided I didn't want my future to be policy. And so I left and for the first maybe five years, I, you know, I had always had to answer my parents, like, when are you going to get a real job? You know, it's like, when are you going to be back and mm -hmm. when are you be done with this gym thing? And it wasn't until I started doing, you know, teaching other trainers and started doing media spokesperson stuff that, you know, I kind of like that got kind of left aside. Legitimize it. Yeah. Yeah, it did. It really, you start doing stuff and, and you start getting featured. And that was one of the things I, in political, when I worked in politics, I'd had media training. And then the one health club company I worked for found that out. Yeah, I told the, the PR person and then I became the go-to person for any media stuff in, in the Washington DC market. So that's kind of how that kind of progressed from there. Do you think that that is changing that people are like, oh, all she is is a trainer or all she is is a yoga instructor? Is that, how is that shifting? I think social media is doing a lot of that shifting, you know, by itself um, just because we've now, I would say social media and also some of the online training and things like that, because now it's almost like you become these superstars, you become these like, you know, I think people actually get into fitness now wanting to become famous and, you know, like then you get, there's all this clout that comes with it. If you, you know, have a lot of followers or if you work for a really big brand that, you know, have this like big name. Um, and so I think when you, when you are, able to sort of speak at that level, then, then there is like a lot of like, oh, there's like a reverence for it, <laughs> you know? Like you're this, some like super expert and for better or for worse, I guess. Well, I always joke, I always joke that fitness instructors were like class D or class E celebrities. Where <laughs> you, know, you wanna call a celebrity, somebody knows your name, but you don't know that person. Because if you're, if you're teaching, you know, four or five nights a week, or if you're teaching 10, 12 classes a week, you're in front of a lot of people. And so you kind of open yourself up a little bit. You, you share about, you know, what's going on at home a little bit. You share. So people know who you are without you really knowing them, but it's only magnified in the past number of years. So I think, yes, yeah. that maybe in the last five, maybe 10 years since the turn, you know, since the start of the 20 teens, that it's really been seen as really a, a, a career to kind of work towards as opposed to something that people fell into or a job that somebody did for a little while. Yeah, I think that that's right. And that's actually a good segue. Can you each tell me a little bit about how you got to do these multifaceted jobs that you do today? Like what led you to this field and this career? Um, I never thought that I would be doing this as, I, I don't even know if I can consider it full time, but even as like my main, you know, thing, um, I actually started teaching, <laughs> I started teaching fitness when I was I started learning how to teach when I was like 17 or 18. Um, and this was in 95, 96, something like that. Um, and I had been taking, you know, step aerobic classes, which were the thing back then, I right? <laughs> fitness, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> it's so great. Um, and, you know, prior to that, I had been doing, you know, VHS tapes in my room here and there and like whatever. Um, and, I was taking a class so much that the instructor was basically like, Hey, do you want to learn how to teach? And I was like, sure. Mm -hmm. And so he actually took me under his wing and was like mentoring me to learn how to teach. And I hadn't even graduated high school yet. 
and I was playing sports and I was doing all the things and like whatever. And then when I went to college and I knew I wasn't going to be able to play sports I, for where I went to college because they were too good at everything. Um, I somehow just like fell into, you know, Stanford had this like aerobics program. It's called Stanford aerobics or something like that. I think it still exists. I used and, to take classes there as a grad student, which is not yeah. like each other, by the way. But anyway, go on. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so I started teaching for them. Like that was like my first teaching job. And then um, off campus, somewhat nearby, there was a 24 hour fitness. And so um, I started teaching there as well. And I was just doing it on the side while I was going to school. Then I, once I graduated, um, I actually became a Spanish teacher. So I was teaching during the day for kids, but in the mornings I was teaching an outdoor morning boot camp, And then the evening, sometimes I was teaching at 24 hour fitness. So I was like all over the place. I, I, you know, things you do in your twenties that I don't understand how I did, but, <laughs> um, you know, and then I went back to school and, you know, I've been teaching this whole time. So I went back to school in LA. I got a job. I just transferred from one 24 hour to the other and just was teaching down there. Um, and that's when I actually started to on my own, this pre, this was pre Facebook. Even I want to say, um, I taught this like Pilates and yoga combination class, Pio, if you, you know it. Um, and it was like a Sunday morning, whatever, but it ended up packing out all the time. And I had like an email list because I was in school. So like, if I went home, I would let people know, Hey, I'm not going to be there, you know, whatever. And I developed this like really big email list, which I wish I had actually done a better job at, you know, I didn't know anything back then about any marketing or whatever, but I was just doing it on like on the fly. Um, and then when I left, what's actually very funny is when I left there uh, at my graduation barbecue, a bunch of my students who came were like, hey, will you film a few workouts so that we could have them? And when you're gone, we can still do them. And I was like, I'm not going to film myself. I, I can't film myself. Like, what are you talking about? You know. And I'm like, oh my God, I could have, all the things that could have happened, <laughs> but I didn't do it. Um, and then I went to Baltimore for my PhD and was teaching there and then using some, some of that same beginning marketing stuff, I was doing that in Baltimore. I created a class called Hip Hop Cycle because I didn't want people to come to my class. Really, the ultimate reason was I just didn't want people to come and request songs that I didn't want to hear. <laughs> so I just was like, let's call it this. Um, and that developed its own brand at the time. Again, I didn't really know what I was doing. I didn't really feel like I was actually creating a brand. Um, and that just kind of snowballed into when I finished my PhD and I moved back to the Bay area and I was just like, I need a break. I don't want to do anything. I don't want to apply for postdocs or, you know, whatever. Um, I, because Baltimore is the, the hub of Under Armour. Also, I had a bunch of Under Armour employees in my class. And so somehow my name got thrown in as they were like sponsoring some trainers. So I was like one of, I think we were, there was five of us for a while. Um, and we're all still super close. None of us are still with Under Armour, but <clears throat> I got sponsored by them. And that just like snowballed into everything because then I got on social media and I started, you know, not because of them, but I, I sort of used like that avenue as a way to be like, hey, I want to do this challenge. Let's call it Sweat a Day. It was kind of off of the campaign that they did. And it just, that's how my social media blew up in the very beginning. Granted, it's, kind of cut itself off <laughs> at one point but you know in the very beginning like being one of the first people that was doing this mm -hmm. it was like a whole different world back then so um and then that just led to you know partnership after partnership after partnership and then I was just like oh I guess I'm not going back to academia and then lo and behold I ended up getting an adjunct position because of everything that I do <laughs> so uh it goes back full circle all the way back and now I'm doing both and something I want to get back to, one of the students asked whether any of your academic sort of colleagues or contacts look askance at a career like in industry and that's so applied, but hold that because I want to okay. get to, to Pete's to talking about how Pete got to where he is today. Go ahead. Well, no, I, I love hearing those stories, right? Because, you know, you see this and, and I think you're right, Natalia, what I, what I love about your, your class, you're doing this class and I know the work you're doing is you're really putting the role of the fitness industry in in society because so many people at least in the people in the circles that we all know fitness is a major part of our, of our lives you know exercise is a major part of our lives but as i mentioned i was working on on capitol hill i was working uh, my last political job 
was actually for handgun control. I was working with Jim and Sarah Brady. And a little small note, one of the people working there, we worked together for a very brief period of time, is Jake Tapper from um, CNN. Oh. Was, we were both, he was like the assistant press guy when I, when I was there. And that's one of the guys who I did my initial press training with. But from there, I got a front desk job at, at a gym, local gym, Washington Sports Clubs, because I wanted the free membership and frankly, to meet women. But that's, <laughs> that's a whole other thing. But it worked. And, and that's not where I met, you know, the woman that, you know, we're now, she's now my ex-wife. But um, I really, I, from front desk, I learned how to teach group fitness. I learned how to teach indoor cycling. I got certified as a personal trainer. And I started out in club management because I wanted a more stable, um, more stable income. And I kind of went the reverse. I went from being a general manager of a health club to being a personal trainer because mm -hmm. doing the payroll, I saw how much the personal trainers were making and they got to come and go and they got to work maybe six or seven hours a day. And I was in the gym nine or 10 hours a day and I was getting the phone calls. If somebody didn't show up for a shift or something broke down, I'm like, something's wrong here. So in the early 2000s, right you know, right around 2000, right in 2000, I became a full-time personal trainer. So I got into fitness full-time in 1998 and in 2000, right in downtown Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. I became, you know, started working as a personal trainer full time. In early 2000s, 2002, I started teaching other personal trainers for my company. So we were growing. I, when I started there in 98, we had five clubs in the D.C. area. And by the time I left uh, D.C. in 2006 to take another job, we had like 18 clubs in the D.C. area. So in wow. that time, you know, fitness, you know, that was in the early 2000s. Fitness was blowing up. It was like everywhere you had a Starbucks and a Barnes and Noble, you had a, a health club yeah. going in. And so I got in the early 2000s. I got into teaching other trainers. I got my, my master's degree in 2006. And I went to work what used to be the Sports Club LA and the Reebok Club. So now it's the Equinox mm -hmm. Sports Club on the Upper West Side where you are, Natalia. Um, but I was their director of education for two years. And then I went to work for the American Council on Exercise, which is one of the major certifications. So they brought me in to develop some of their education curriculum. And it was funny because when I started my, when I started my grad school program, and this is for your students, for your students to write down goals, because I wrote, my goals were get my, get my degree, become a director of education for a health club company, and then go to work for a certification. And then after that, I either wanted up to open up my own studio or to do what I'm doing now, work freelance as a consultant. So mm -hmm. I still, I still freelance, I consult with the American Council on Exercise, and I also work with the National Academy of Sports Medicine. So I work, I, I'm very fortunate and kind of funny enough, I work with the two major certifications and I, I'm very open about that. It's kind of like dating two different women at the same time. <laughs> it's a little, you just have to communicate and, and I don't share any, you know, I don't talk about what one is the other is doing unless I see it in a trade publication. Um, but I, then I work with, with companies like Nautilus and Stairmaster. So I really, I mean, it, it's kind of like, but I, I'll say this and I'll wrap it up with this. Yeah. Working in politics, I worked on Capitol Hill for Senator Feinstein for a little while before I went off the Hill. Mm -hmm. I was a C or B student in, in the world of politics. But when I got to fitness, if you're a B student in politics, you're kind of an A plus student in the fitness world. I got certified in 1998. And then I went to work for a certification in 2008. So it took me 10 years to go from working the front desk to working for one of the certifications. The that, point is, yeah. yeah, if you work hard, I mean, if you work hard and put yourself out there, you can make things happen. That is very interesting, that metaphor. Well, your whole career is super interesting. And actually that Upper West Side Health Club, it's funny, I didn't even know you worked there. I, in my first like entree to working in the fitness industry at all, was I worked the front desk at the World Gym across the street uh -huh. from that because I wanted to take free classes in college. And like, it was a 24 hour gym. Like I didn't know I was watching fitness history because World Gym, it had been this bodybuilding gym, <laughs> 90s was like transitioning to put yoga and group fitness on the schedule and all these yeah. women were so pissy about it they'd like come in and the like the way the heavy room was like way in the yeah. back anyway we could reminisce for a long time but pete that's super interesting when you say like a b student in politics was like an a student in fitness is that you think it's like easier to rise because it was a less mature industry is that what you're saying i don't want to put words in your mouth Actually, that, that's a good i don't know if it was a less mature industry but i think um I think sometimes you have to be very forward about what you want and knowing how to network. And I think having worked in DC a little bit, and I grew up, I mean, I grew up, my, my mother was a lobbyist for years and she started her own firm back when I was in college, she started her own kind of lobbying consulting firm. So I grew up, my summer vacations were going to, she worked with mayors and city councils. Mm -hmm. So my summer vacations would be going to some town somewhere 
meeting a mayor, meeting a member of a city council. She had yeah. been a city council person when I was growing up in North Carolina, when I was really young in North Carolina. So I grew up around politics. So I grew up with, you know, me networking, right? And, and so when I got into fitness and when I started working and I knew what I wanted to do, which was get into education, I just would, I'd be very forward about if I knew that you're somebody I wanted to meet, I'd go up and shake my, shake your hand and meet you at a conference and follow up with you. And so I was very, I was somewhat aggressive about that. And I think what, what Natalia, what you just said is, is in combination with that, right? Because it was a sort of immature like industry at the time and you were so like about it people were just like okay you know what i mean well, like, like i, I said the psi i mean the company i worked for grew from five club it grew 300 percent in six yeah. years mm -hmm. and so getting i got an edu i honestly got an education right at the right time yeah. because it constantly needed to train and educate new staff and so i was working three weekends a month teaching workshops for the for new trainers in the company Mm -hmm. So interesting. Yeah, it does seem like both of you sort of came of age in the industry at a moment when like it became dynamic enough that people with a lot of options wanted to expend their energy there. So people like you who could have worked in a lot of different things were like, no, this is where it's happening. And so you can make things happen like very quickly. Um, and I also think that there's some there's some degree of like the people who came up in the, in the time that we're talking about, right? Like the late 90s with everything being so new and with like it being so unknown, I think if you were able to somewhat make it, then you had already like developed this like scrappiness about being in the industry that when opportunities came up, you're like, all right, well, let's just try it, <laughs> you know, because like you already had that, like that scrappy nature, at least that's how, it, that's what I see. You know, it's like, I had been teaching already by the time I got sponsored by Under Armour, which was in 2012, 13, something like that, maybe. Mm -hmm. I had been teaching since 96. It's not like I was brand new and was like, right. oh my God, what do I do? <laughs> it's like, this yeah. is what I do. So I, I think that there's, there's also this like this, there, it was a very different time then. Like you had to be, there was no marketing for your classes. There was no like, so like people literally stood in line and wrote their name down on a piece of paper to save their spot in class. And you could only do that 30 minutes. You know what I mean? Like there was, it just was like a totally different time. So you both talked a lot about working with different brands and you've both worked with all the biggest brands in the fitness business from like a lot of different angles. One of the students asked how you make decisions about which brands to work for. And I assume they mean both like what makes it worth it for you, but also ethically. There's no brand these days that has escaped like some bad behavior, particularly <laughs> when you're in the intimate business of bodies and health. Yeah. And, like, there's a lot of ways to screw up. And so I don't know if you each have like a philosophy or if you even have stories that illustrate how you make these choices. I have a lot of stories uh, because I'm very, very particular. And you're right. There's no, there's no brand that's going to be perfect. There's no, you know, um, no way to fully escape these mishaps that happen. Um, but you know, my number one thing is coming from the background that I come from, where I had an eating disorder, and I'm very like adamant about the way that we talk about the body and you know how we utilize fitness for the sake of the body and aesthetics and all of this, right? So I refuse to work with anybody who calls themselves like in, in any of the marketing is skinny or weight loss or, you know, like any of those like trigger words, I'm just like flat across the board, no, unless there's a way to change the name, right? Like, I mean, even some articles like, you know, six, seven years ago, I remember there was an article that someone was like, hey, can you give me, um, it was like 10 TRX moves for, a skinny something or other. And I was like, can we call it something else? And they were like, no. And I was like, well then no, <laughs> I can't. Yeah. Um, so I, you know, that's one thing. And then, you know, I also, I personally don't drink and I have nothing against it, but like I just yesterday got something from a Budweiser campaign and you know, where it's easy for me to do that. It's not like they're forcing me to drink. I don't need to drink whatever I could. But it's like, is that really my brand? Am I really actually promoting something that I would use? And so that's my other sort of, you know, there's the ethic thing. And then there's also like, am I actually using this product? Is this something that I would actually, you know, so I refuse to like promote a product unless I've at least tried it. Yeah. Um, and I'm very particular about how I work with brands around those things. 
Yeah. Well, I, I like this question because I think a lot of people, I've seen a lot of people in our industry that kind of a new product will come along. They'll kind of like, they want to go work with that. And then they dilute themselves because they like, they're seen mm -hmm. as being with so many different products. Mm -hmm. And I've been very particular to me, a product has to have a legitimate purpose or has to have really a, a good scientific validity behind it before I want to go, before I want to get behind it and work with it. And that's just coming from having worked with a certification group. And I love your point, Shauna, because I am not, you know, I have never been, I've always been a, a thicker guy. You know, I am not like Johnny six pack. I just show that down, but I'm not, I was never about the aesthetics. My background was never about bodybuilding. My background was never about looking a certain way. I was always, I played rugby and it was always about, are you strong enough for your sport? Are you fit? I played for rugby. I didn't know that. Yeah, you're probably, but, but my, my training was always about being one of the fittest guys on the team. Who cares what I look like? I didn't, you know, your muscles don't know. They only want to know that you can perform. Yeah. But as a consultant, what I look at is I look at brands that really, what's their legitimacy? What, how do they apply the science? And this is a product that everybody can use. To your point, Shonda, everybody has to be able to use it. I don't want to make a product that's going to be going after a niche market, or, or I don't want to work with a product that's going to be, you know, kind of just marketing without any real science behind it. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, when I got the opportunity to work, I mean, to your point, Natalia, we had this exchange on Twitter a little while ago about, you know, the, the founder of Nautilus. The, you know, the founder of Nautilus has had, you know, but he's no longer involved. I mean, he hasn't been involved with the company for years, but, yeah. you know, I now have the opportunity. I mean, this is one of the biggest brands. You know, if you ask people, you know, what name five brands, non-fitness people name five brands from fitness, Nautilus and Stairmaster are probably two of the top brands they know off the top of their head. And now to be one of the people to have the opportunity to work with those brands is really, to me, kind of like the, the pinnacle of, of my education career. And so that's where I've been, you know, I've had opportunities to go do other things, but mm -hmm. I've turned them down because I want to stay with, you know, well-known brands that really have, that have a solid place in the industry that have a legitimacy there and, and that everybody can have access to. That is I would also yeah. add to this that I also take into consideration, like if I'm working with a brand, how how the relationship is with the brand, because I want to actually have a relationship with the brand, which is one of the reasons why I've stayed away from having an agent thus far, because I have the direct relationship with the brand. So, yeah. and with the person who's, you know, in the marketing position or whatever, so that like that relationship will carry over to other brands and like whatever. But it's also like, I feel like I'm valued Right. As much as I value who they are. Right. So there, there's also that aspect of it. Yeah, I think that's really important. So this course um, you may or may not know, I might have told you. So it's a university wide lecture and our biggest contingent of students at the new school are um, from Parsons, which is design or fashion. So a lot of students are very interested in like kind of the ethics of working with companies, you know? So I think this is very, yeah. very helpful because again, none is perfect. And this is like a bigger theme of the course, which is like fitness is such a huge part of our lives, but it's pretty much all, not all, but mostly um, available through industry. Like we don't have a growing commitment to phys ed. We don't have a growing commitment to public right. recreation right now, which is a big problem. We shouldn't just call said and done but i think a lot of students kind of have this realistic take of like being that that's the case right now i want to make change and that means working with brands and like how do i do that in a way that like upholds my beliefs and like makes the world a better place this is really helpful well and sometimes when you come into a brand you know i mean again you may have certain preconceived notions but you have an opportunity to have some influence about what that message can be going forward right so depending on it doesn't matter what the message was in the past you, know, you always have an opportunity to kind of shift and craft that message. Mm -hmm. And that's been one of the biggest opportunities working with, with, you know, with core health and fitness, which is the parent company of, of Nautilus and Stairmaster is to be able, okay, how do we now guide the message to really try to be inclusive and try to be approachable by everybody who might be coming into a fitness facility. I yeah. think, and again, that's the other thing that I paid attention to, you know, that was a hard part about having worked for a company that was very exclusive, like the sports club LA you know, we used to have valet, you know, they had a valet car park and you come out in the morning, there'd be two or three Bentleys down in front of the health club. And it was like, okay, but I wanted to do something more where it was more accessible by everybody because this is, you know, everybody needs the benefits of being able to exercise on a regular basis. And I know Shauna, that's a big concern in some of the work that you do, right? Is how do we make yeah. this accessible for everybody so everybody can have access to this? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 It's huge. Go ahead. No, go ahead. 
Oh, so, you know, as a historian, I look at change over time. And as a historian, we also often resist like the simplistic, it used to be bad and it's only been getting better. Or we used to have this golden age and now everything sucks. And I'm curious to know, like I see a more complicated narrative emerging both in the research I've done, but also even the way you describe your own trajectories, that in some ways, We've got this bigger industry. We've got more like people with really credible scientific backgrounds coming into the world, more people going into the gym, et cetera. On the other hand, we have like, oh, you have a million followers. You must know what you're doing. Like, mm -hmm. what do you think where fitness is moving towards uh, having a more positive impact in the world? What are, yes, no. What are some of the factors that you look at in, in making those kind of assessments? I mean, I would say yes and no. <laughs> Good, nice um, complex thinker there, Shana. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, I think from looking at this from public health perspective, right, there's two things happening. One, fitness in the sense of it becoming this more trendy thing to do will have a trickle down effect because there's going to be more industry, there's more focus, there's more like all attention, like all of this stuff on movement in all of its different ways right you have every hybrid possible at this point and you have all kinds of studios and i mean granted all of this COVID is a very different scenario but um <laughs> i'm sure we'll get to that um but at the same time it's 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 very uh reminiscent of like what's actually happening in the us where you're having like this elite like classes are costing more and more and more and clothes are costing more and more and more and all of the products and all of the things and all the, you know, the accessories that you need create this like very, very elite group of people that can access what is the trendiest thing happening in fitness. Where as Pete was saying, we have this issue of accessibility that's problematic for a large majority of the U S and mm -hmm. it's like, while we're bringing more attention to it, which is great, we also are still also creating like a bigger gap between the haves and the have nots. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is a huge problem. Um, and, you know, I think this COVID situation is also pointing that out in, in various ways. Um, but, you know, I do think, I do think that there's some degree of great that's happening. And then there's some degree of, we have a lot of work to do. <laughs> um, and also like, I mean, and that goes for many different things, right? That goes for like the popularity of instructors that have like millions and millions of followers. Or I shouldn't say instructors. Let me back up. Population of people who have millions and millions of followers who maybe not don't have like the same kind of uh, certification or qualifications yes, or yeah. anything. <laughs> um, and what comes with that and the social media aspect is also this like very aesthetically focused, aesthetically driven um, part of fitness, which is very different from the movement is good to prevent chronic disease and to get you healthy and to keep you living longer, <laughs> sort of, you know, so we have this like dichotomy happening. Yeah. What do you Sorry, think? I got my, my dog is chewing something, chewing one of her that's toys. Kind of like, is that an animal or a child? If you hear it growling, that's what it is. But I really, but, but when we look at it, I mean, because one of the things I love about following you on Twitter, um, Doc, Natalia, is, is that, I mean, I always like to call it Doc, so I'll refer I'll to you as Doc. <laughs> right. but what, I, what I like about it is, is you've done a great job of showcasing the history. And, and as somebody, I mean, I am a history geek myself, and that's why I love, love what you've done, because you can look at the early to mid 80s as kind of like the early golden age of fitness when it became, because look at the movie stars in the 70s. You know, they, they had like no, you know, in the 80s, all of a sudden, all the movie stars had to be buff and be muscular. And you had, you know, Von Damme, you had, you know, Schwarzenegger, you had, you had Stallone. So you kind of, that drove fitness. So were the 80s a golden age? Or, you know, was it, you know, the early 2000s when you had, you know, you had Seinfeld, I know, so it was late 90s. Because if you remember in the 90s, Seinfeld, one of the recurring themes was there would always be at the fitness, at the gym. You know, mm -hmm. when Elaine was, you know, was flirting with John F. Kennedy Jr., you know, so fitness has always been kind of in the background of, of popular culture, but I would argue that now we're kind of in the golden age because when I went to college, you know, I graduated high school in 1990. You know, if I, you know, the only thing I would have done with a PE degree or with a kinesiology degree was either be a PE teacher or be a physical mm -hmm. therapist. There was no career in fitness. It wasn't until maybe 
the mid 2000s when, when I was working full time as a personal trainer and group fitness instructor that you could be, or start earning a viable career in fitness. It's only been maybe since 03 or 04 because, you know, and I want to mention this earlier, back in the early 2000s, Natalia, there were maybe four or five Equinox locations in New York City. You know, and now you have Equinox in almost every other corner. You know, TSI, New York Sports Clubs, has locations almost in every other corner. So over the years, in the past 15, 20 years, gyms went from being a very kind of a very hard to find. And you do a great job of writing about that, you know, with, with the whole gay culture of what a gym used to be, what it used to mean to the gay subculture in the 50s and 60s. Now gyms are becoming anchors. And now with the collapse of the, you know, of, of the shopping mall, gyms and fitness studios are now the new anchor stores mm -hmm. for certain developments. And that changed in the 2000s. That legitimately changed from the 90s where it was hard to find a gym when I was in DC. And I'll finish with this one. When, when I did my semester abroad in London in 1993, there were two commercial fitness facilities in downtown London in 1993. There's a YMCA and there's a big posh high-end health club. And other than that, gyms were not really that existent in London in 93. And I was a student that wanted to stay in shape for you know, I was playing American football at the time before I got into rugby. And now in London, you know, you can't swing a dead cat without hitting a soul cycle or an orange theory or an, you know, it's, it's just changed. It's become, the gym has become the new corner store, you know, it's part social, part health and part everything. So I would, I would say that now we're kind of in the golden age of fitness and, and that's how it's evolved from that. I agree with you in terms of the role it plays in people's lives, because I do think a lot more people with a lot of different body sizes and backgrounds, et cetera, are finding like community through fitness. I do worry with this like big business corner store thing that whereas it's true that it was harder to make it in the days that like you all came up in, now in some ways, don't you see a kind of de-skilling of fitness labor that like, oh, now it's plug and play. We can not give you health benefits and pay you very little because we're we're not asking you to come up with this brilliant creative content. We have like a basically right. uh, pre-format and that worries me. I understand how that's about standardizing control, but I or standardizing quality, but I worry that that makes the fitness workers who are actually more and more important in people's lives, actually less and less valued from an economic standpoint. And I know we're getting late. So I'll, one more question after this, I promise. But what do you think of that? I mean, I, I agree. Like I, I think coming up when I came up, like I was saying, someone took me under their wing. Mm -hmm. So for weeks on weeks on weeks on weeks, he would work with me after class, teaching me about music, teaching me about cueing, teaching me about how to structure a class, how to choreograph a class. All of these things would let me teach little pieces of his class. Like I learned the teaching techniques from, from this per perspective that doesn't even exist anymore. Like that doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, like then I went and got my certifications and, you know, started learning about like all of the other aspects of, of fitness from the body perspective and then went into public health, which is looking at it from a completely different perspective. Right. So it's like, and, and that doesn't happen. And one of the things that's been worrying me for a really long time. And I personally, won't teach at a place that won't allow me to do my own workout partially because I've been doing this for so long and like I just really like to be creative and I want that flexibility to be you know if I want to change something I want to be able to change it I don't want to have to like but I've seen it where this plug and play you lose a lot you lose the teaching technique you lose the ability to think on your feet and to change when things need to be changed at the last second. And I, I just think that as an instructor overall, and I, I'm not speaking to personal trainers because I don't really, that's not my world as much, but like from an instructor's perspective, you have a room full of people and you just never know. Like if I go into a room and, and I'm going to teach my class that I created and I'm teaching an event and I have no idea if these people have done any, like any yoga before, any fitness before, or if they're like, you know, they've been doing it for years and years and years. I have the ability to adjust on the fly and change up my whole workout if I need to. Mm -hmm. And I watch these new instructors because I do take a ton of classes because I, I just love, I love it. And I, I think that that's missing. And I, I really worry, like, like you're saying that um, we're losing a little bit of the quality 
and I'm being sort of nice by saying a little bit, um, <laughs> we're losing some of the quality um, that comes with that time spent, you know, really like learning how to do what we do because it's just like, go get the certification. Here's a, a link to teach this course, go memorize it and then send us a video and teach it. You know, like, I feel like that's a pretty common thing these days. And I just, it, it, it does worry me. And there are brands that are doing an amazing job at making sure that their, their instructors are very, very qualified and like continually qualified, but it does worry me a little bit. It, but I think that's part of it because I mean, fitness has become so popular and, and where you are in the city in Italia in, in like in New York and LA, it's no longer no, performers. Actors are no longer asked, where do you wait tables? It's where do you teach fitness? Yeah. Where, where, you mm -hmm. know, what soul cycle are you at? What berries are you, you know, because now people, you know, in those markets, if, if I'm, if I'm an actor looking for work, I'm going to get a job as a, as a, um, as an instructor because I can perform in front of the class. They're going to mm -hmm. teach me enough of what I need to know to be able to perform in front of a class and I can hone my skills that way. So on one hand, you've had some people kind of that they make this look easy, but their backgrounds and performance. And I, I'm talking about this from two different points of view. One, having worked for a certification for a number of years and create the education. When I worked there, I was really focused on writing education that would help people become chefs, right? Because we want people to be able, a chef can take any three, you can take chicken, beans, and rice and come up with a number of different ingredients, you know, a number of different dishes mm -hmm. by adding certain ingredients to it. You, yeah. you know, add these spices and it's this type of dish, add these spices, but you're teaching people how to be a chef. Now that I work on the equipment side, we're in the equipment company, we want people to be able to use, use our equipment. So now I got to teach people how to be a line cook. I'm not teaching them how to create the dish. I'm just teaching them how to execute saying, here's a high intensity interval workout, go teach it. Here's how you structure it. Here's how you build it. Here's, you know, boom, boom, boom. It's a lot more handholding. You know, when I'm writing education for Stairmaster, it's not the science of, okay, here's metabolism, yada, yada, yada. It's more like, okay, here's a split. 30 seconds of work, 20 seconds of recovery, boom, do this exercise. Yeah. And so you're really, we, a lot of this has to do with like, look at the education system. Or the other thing I'm, I'm going to look at is a lot of instructors that come into this, they don't want to be wrong. That was the one thing I get a lot, I get a lot teaching workshops is people don't want to be wrong. They don't want to do things the right way. And so they look to these groups that kind of hand feed them the workouts and go, okay, they follow that. Cause it takes a lot. It, I mean, you know, this, both of you have taught group fitness. You're in front of a room with 20 to 30 people staring at you. That's an awful lot of responsibility, right? Totally. Mm -hmm. And you don't want to be wrong. And it takes a lot of confidence to say, I know the workout program I'm putting together is going to work. Yeah. And so I think it takes time for people to develop that confidence and they rely on those kind of pre-programmed workouts. So that said, I think, there's a need to have some of those pre-programmed workouts for consistency and delivery to the, the experience of what people can expect. But at the same time, we have to look at ourselves as an industry and do a better job of educating people so they know how to design their own programs. They know how to design their own group yeah. workouts and they know how to create, you know, we want, I, cause personally I want both line cooks and I want chefs. Yeah. I want people that can do both and be able to have both, both skill sets. I, I, I love this metaphor, by the way, this chef line cook thing, because I would actually add on to that, that I think a lot of what's happening now is we just have, we have wait staff. Totally. We have people, bad, yes. <laughs> we have people who, you know, there are the people who are the chefs. We have the people who are the line cooks who are, you know, learning all these things and a little bit more specifically and then able to deliver it. But I feel like what a lot of what's happening now is and you mentioned this also pete this sort of performance aspect of it right where it's like we want someone who can take that food from the line deliver it to the table and like yeah. deliver it so, so that we, hands, we're know, singing yeah, happy yeah, birthday yeah. and we're like you know I, doing yeah. all the things and getting the the big tips and like you know the whole the whole show and it's not to say that that's not important because it is important uh -huh. to me. That is just not the, my number one priority. I walk into a room. My number one priority is safety. My number two priority is to get you a solid workout or class or whatever it is that I'm delivering. And then my number three priority is to make it fun. Right. But like, I'm not going to even touch fun. If I am concerned, you're going to fall off a treadmill or, you know, drop a weight on your foot or whatever it is. Like that's always going to be my number one priority. And I think this 
this metaphor of like having this wait staff is is the concerning part. And it's like, you can have the wait staff as long as they've gone through the training and understand what the chef is doing, understand what the line cook is doing, and then can deliver the, the party at the table. Right. No, I, it's like, I never thought about completely. I like that though. I like, cause it is, cause it is the wait staff that brings the food and brings the menu to life. Cause how often do yep. you rely on the server to say, what do you recommend today? And then, and you had great servers saying like, Oh, I want that because they do such a good job of describing that. You're like, that sounds delicious. Cause mm -hmm. you can have the best chef in the world. And all you, if you have a server that comes up, here's the menu, what do you want? Yeah. It ruins it. It doesn't get, it doesn't be able to share it. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's right. I also like Pete that you use the term education rather than training in, um, I think that gets to a distinction that you're all both referring to also in edge in the like education world, which I came, my first book was about the history of schools. That's a big difference. Like education is about yeah. learning and having the capacity to like the skills and the crit critical thought faculties to do things yourself. Whereas training is like, was often tar is like targeted at a much lower level of performance here, I'm going to teach you to do this particular thing without a connection to sort of like the broader meaning. And yeah, you know, it's much more limited. Um, okay, so we really have to wrap up, although I could talk to you for like six hours. <laughs> but um, so here we are, I'm like sitting in my basement, like all the gyms in America are basically closed. Like, what is coming next? <laughs> Shana, I'm uh, what do you think, Sean? You've been in the Bay Area. No, we talked about this recently on, on the podcast. And, and that's, you know, we did. I, what do you think? I mean, you're seeing what's happening in the Bay Area. Um, I, yeah, well, I'm assuming you mean like what's coming next, like what's post COVID or as we come, right? as we come out of this. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's really interesting. Like I've had this conversation numerous times with numerous people and I, I think a couple things are happening right now. Obviously the, the home workout I actually just wrote an article about this too, but the home workout, um, thing has been around. Like I said, I was doing VHS tapes in my room, you know, like it's been around for a really long time. It's not new the online workout thing is not not new it's not as old as that but it's not that new either you know none of this this stuff is is new but this scenario is extremely new and what i see from like you know behavioral health and health communication are like my jam when it comes to public health and so when i'm looking at what's happening from a fitness world i'm just like i'm seeing these two things i'm seeing like the technology and the things that are happening because we're stuck at home and because we have these online capabilities. Mm -hmm. And again, we're speaking of the people who are able to do all of these things. So there's a whole accessibility and privilege that comes with all of this, which is actually what my article was about. But yeah. um, so just putting that, it, we're, we already uh, are understanding of that, but the, the, the behaviors that are coming with this are super fascinating to me because you have people who've already been working out at home. Maybe they were doing Peloton. Maybe they were doing, you know, some videos or, you know, an app or whatever it is. And they have already developed, developed those habits. You know, I think a lot of the like beach body stuff helped out with some of those at home habits. But there's a lot of people who have only been going to the gym or have only been taking classes and do that because they can't imagine working out at home. But, mm -hmm. but now everybody's working out at home. If you were someone who was working out before, yeah. right? Like now you, now you're developing these habits and it's been long enough slash it will be long enough where like actual habits will have been formed. And I think there's going to be some degree of keeping this at home because there are things about it that make it so easy right? Like you just walk downstairs, even for me as a teacher, just walk downstairs in my living room. I don't have to sit in traffic for, you know, however long. And I can teach to people who don't just live here in Oakland, you know, even in the Bay area, the Bay area traffic is ridiculous. So anybody who lives in San Francisco or the South Bay or the Peninsula or anywhere else can't come take my class at 6:30 on a Tuesday, Yeah, but they can take my class online. And same thing with like the people I've taught in New York or LA or, you know, whatever, Baltimore. And so I think, there's gonna be some degree of this sticking for, for the habit reason. I also think there's a little bit of fear that will come with all of this of people not wanting to be near other people. But then at the same time, I also think that there's gonna be this like, oh my God, I'm so starved for my people and so starved for that like connection that I got in the room that makes group fitness what it is, where people are just gonna be like, let me out, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, I, I, I think that there's going to be, I, I think a lot of the small chain 
and or not even chain the small studios and like mom and pop studios i'm really concerned that they're not going to make it to be honest but i do think there's there's going to be like this dual thing happening where it's like we have all this online stuff and now people are can do it and we'll do it and now we have this other like once we can get out let's go <laughs> Well, I, I think it's not only the small mom and pop, but um, just, and this is in the trade, these are, this is in the trade press. You have both 24 hour fitness and um, TSI, Town Sports International, two of the top five largest club operators right now are teetering on the verge of bankruptcy. And they were mm -hmm. on the verge of bankruptcy before COVID-19 started. Mm -hmm. They both, both companies have overloaded with debt in terms of expansion and all this other stuff, but that's a whole nother, I mean, that's a whole nother conversation. Oh, related. What's yeah. that? It's related to it. But it's not yeah. related because now they can't collect dues or now they're not collecting dues. And so they still have to pay their realtors. They still have to pay their, their real estate and all that. I really do think, you know, to, to Sean's point, we crave the social interaction of being at the gym of like-minded people. And for me as like myself, I mean, it's one thing to do a yoga workout at home, but I don't have 400 pounds of weights in the home. You know, I have a couple right. of kettlebells. But for people that want to lift heavy, and it's both genders want to lift heavy, yeah. not everybody has an Olympic weight set at home. Not everybody has an Olympic weightlifting platform at home or a collection of kettlebells at home. So I think you are going to see people coming back to the gym because that's their tribe. That's, that's what they like to do. It's like you have the religious people want to get back to their church. You have you know, certain people want to get back to their favorite thing. It just, I do think we're going to see a much, you know, it's going to be much tighter on cleanliness. You know, that's the one thing that we saw in early March was the gyms would started becoming much cleaner. I noticed the three or four gyms I go to regularly in Southern California were doing a much better job of cleanliness and people are being, you know, members are being much paying much more attention. You know, this whole idea of wearing a mask while working out, I mean, I know we're gonna have to get used to a new normal and I'm in a different, I'm in Carlsbad, California. I mean, both of you have been in this area and I know Doc, you're here, Natalia, you're here a couple of years ago with your family. Yeah. So we're in this like beautiful little idea. Like I, I don't know what it's going to be like in Manhattan. I have no idea what it's going to be like in Manhattan. I have no idea what it's going to be like in downtown San Francisco where you have the population density and you've had a much higher impact of this virus on how people, on people's quality of life. So to be honest, I, I'm not hundred percent certain. I just know that people are really eager to get back into the gyms and get back to that connection, you know, both from the member side, who just want to be out of the house, right? They want to be away from their family. They want to be out again and be free. And then from the instructor side, I don't know about you guys, but instructors I know are going nuts not having an audience to be in front of, right? Because you get used to teaching, you need that to be in front of an audience. And, and having one digital eye staring at you isn't the same as having 30 eyes at, you know, with you in a room. So I, I think we're going to get back to, it won't be the same as it used to be, but I think in the fitness industry, more so than other industries, we will kind of fall back into a lot of our regular habits just because we've been doing this for so long and people enjoy it. For a lot of people, this is our second life. This is our, it's our third space, you know, as Howard Schultz you know, identified it, right? It's not home. It's not work. Most of the people, most of the people I know, I, they're just, they need that fix. They need to be in that environment with their friends and like-minded individuals. But I will say, no matter how much of a fix we need, no matter how much people are going to crave that, we are still at the mercy of the way that we're going to come out of this. And we're not going to just come right back. So the ramp up that's going to happen with how we come back to normal, first of all, normal is never going to be what it was for mm -hmm. anything, let alone fitness, right? Yeah. But as we come back to this normal, like, it's not just going to be like, oh my God, now I can go back and now I can, everything's going to be the same. It's, it's just not going to be like that. Right. So I, I think, you know, we have, we do have this desire to like go back to like the, the things that we love, but we have to be realistic about, you know, the public health side of this and how that's actually going to happen. You know, like there's going to be, at least in the beginning, my sense is, you know, they're going to, extremely limit the number of people that can be in the classes that can be in the gyms. There's all these different protocols that are going to happen and like shifts of people. And, you know, there's going to have to be like a completely different sense and the masks and the, you know, whatever. So like, it's going to be a while before we get back to like 
normal. I don't, I don't even know that word is, I don't even know what that's going to mean. <laughs> and right. I think, and something I think about all the time, picking up on all the comments that both of you made is like, you know, new habits are being formed and new investments. Like I hate working out at home, but now there's no other option. I bought a Peloton, which I can't wait to. Oh, like, yeah. That's like a lot of money. You have to tell me your name. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so like, I'm not, that's not like a, you know, whim purchase. Like that's something that I'll yeah. do. And one of the reasons I got it is that I was like, if like, what are the things I'll go back to? Sorry, I think that's my kids up there. Um, I will probably not go back to a sweaty spin studio. Like that feels like a sort of like germ breeding place. I also think of one of my favorite studios that I go to, which I won't say because I'm about to say I probably won't go back there, but it involves a lot of switching. And all I'm thinking is touching that TRX, touching that kettlebell, touching that rower mm -hmm. three different times four different teams like that the medicine balls that you slam down you know and it's like i love that and i love so much of that kind of workout but to me that's probably like the last thing that i'll come back like those kind of if it ever does i mean hopefully it will at some point but you know because that just like you can't control for it in that you know in those environments yeah i think you're dead on uh, yeah well, i think real quick to, to add on to add on this i know we're wrapping up but what one of my friends said and i think you both know her trisha murphy madden yeah. um, so she was suggesting that people that clubs might be selling kits that it's like, if you're going to go and take classes, you might buy, if you're going to go take a certain class, you might buy your own TRX, you might buy your own medicine ball, or you might, and maybe that's new, but that's new revenue. I didn't even thought about that. That's a new revenue, revenue opportunity for Jim is I can get a locker. I mean, Jim's have always had those monthly rentals. Now, if I'm really a class person, maybe I'm going to pay an extra few dollars a month. I'm going to keep my equipment here. I'm going to keep my TRX at the gym. I'm going to keep my own personal medicine ball or my own personal elastic bands. I hadn't even thought about that, but that might be yeah. something we see down the line of a new opportunity because every crisis creates new opportunities and new business models, right? I mean, you can totally. sit there and be like chicken little and say, oh, the sky is falling. Or you can say, all right, well, we have to change the way we do business. So how are we going to change the way we do business? I mean, the glove manufacturers, like already the weightlifting gloves, someone's designing some awesome new prototype for like <laughs> <laughs> the gym. Oh, yeah. and the masks and the running and the whole like yeah because exactly. i almost suffocated when i tried to run just a half a mile <laughs> with my yeah. mask on i was like maybe not <laughs> well yeah i know the god we can talk about this forever we didn't even talk about apparel i am gonna let you two go because you are have so many other people probably to share your brilliance with but um thank you i'm so so grateful and uh yeah thanks for all the work thank you for having me and us yeah, thanks doc this is a lot of fun this is, you guys are awesome. Let me stop the recording. Right. Hold on. Let's see. Stop.